Welcome everybody to Lee's podcast. I'm your host Lee Yang. Well, I got a special guest with me today. Can you introduce yourself? Hi guys, my name is Chancellor Yang. Hey Chancellor, thanks for coming in today and sitting down with me to have this podcast. You know what? When I when I was thinking about having this podcast, I thought of you because right. because you have such an interesting story to share, right? And I know we kind of spoke right before we came on here that you're kind of like an open book, mm-hmm. but you know, share what as much as you want. Thank okay. you. Okay. So, so let's start off, and I do this with everybody that I have on my show. I know you. Yep. Right. You're related to Auntie. Yep. And so, where are you living at now, man? I am residing in Rochester, Minnesota, so just roughly an hour away from the cities. Okay. Just by chance, you're here in Milwaukee. I am. <laughs> it was very spontaneous. Me and my sisters plan a like just like a sibling trip, and so we just happened to like get on together. And we're like, okay, let's go. So now yeah. we're here. So what are you up to right now? What do you do nowadays? So right now, I work inside Sephora. So like the actual makeup cosmetics company. Um, I am the licensed beauty advisor there. In Rochester, Minnesota. Okay. Yeah. A little background for everybody that's listening, right? Um, and you dive into as much as you want. Absolutely. Okay. So um, what is it that you do there and how come you work there and who are you? So what I do there is I basically I am a makeup artist. Um, I went to beauty school, got my esthetician license because in order to do makeup at the time in Minnesota, you needed to be licensed to do it. So then um, I am, right now, I am the only licensed beauty advisor there, meaning that I'm the only one with an active esthetician license. Yep. So I'm the only one that's able to do makeup cosmetic services. Okay. Yes. um, I enjoy what I do. I love what I do. I think the industry is great. It never stops, and it's always evolving. That's probably why I love it so much. Um, It's one of those industries where I feel like you're always constantly learning, and you're always wanting to up your skills to be sure that you're on top of trends and on top of whatever people come in for. Okay, cool. All right. Now, there's also something about you that the audience, I would like the audience to know, all right? And this is something that I'm sure you know in our (laughs) mom community. It's Mm -hmm. like, it's, would you say it's a taboo? I don't know. I don't, see, I don't know because to me, it's like I listen. Yeah. And I would like to think that everybody thinks the way I think, Mm -hmm. which is more accepting of everybody of who they are. Oh, don't we all wish that? (laughs) Well, that's true, <laughs> but just even being Asian, right? Yeah, it's, it's very like, <laughs> oh, like, do we want to talk about it? Do we not talk about it? It's it's very like, there's a lot of silver lines, I feel like, especially for a culture. It's yeah. hard to perceive. I feel like it used to be like more not talked about, but I feel like a lot of younger generations now are being more open, more accepting. So it's giving us a little bit of a leeway to be more open about it. Cool, yeah. Um, I think there's still definitely a perception of... Oh, like y'all, like there's like a and there's like obviously the church way. Culture plays a lot into like the church way too, which I feel like there should be a very fine division between culture aspects and religious aspect. Um, but I don't feel like it's much of a taboo as it used to be. I think is it more talked about now? Absolutely. Is it still kind of shunned away sometimes? Absolutely. Yeah. So it's like a weird middle line, I feel like. So let me ask the ultimate question then. Yeah. What do you identify as? I am, I identify as male, pronouns are he, she, and I am gay. Okay. Yeah. You know what? That's so, I know of a few people mm-hmm. and there's a few people I assume. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, they should be who they are. Absolutely. You know, yeah. because I don't want my kids, like I talk to my kids all the time, mm-hmm. right? I want you to be who you are yeah. no matter what it is. Absolutely. Right. If you, if you're not good at doing something X, Y, and Z, that's fine. Yeah. You know, and let's work on that. So I can help you mm-hmm. if you want to, I don't know, like, like for example, here's another, I'm not sure if the monk taboo, but like. Are you going to date outside of the culture? Yeah, right? So, no, no, I'm just, I'm yeah. not asking you no, that no, question, yeah. but but I'm asking the kids there, like, yeah. you know, what if they date outside of the culture, right? Mm-hmm. What if it's an African-American person? Yeah. What if it's, you know, a Caucasian? What if it's whatever it is, right? Mm-hmm. And as a mom parent, you know, I'm okay with it. Yeah. Auntie and I, we talked about mm-hmm. it. We're totally cool about it, yeah. right? Um, if, you know, other parents that are a little older or maybe has... Um, different mindset. Different mindset. Yeah. They're like, nope. You gotta keep it. You have to keep it specifically Hmong, mm-hmm. or you have to keep it specifically Christians, yeah. or you have to keep it specifically this. And so there's a set of rules. Yes. That, not to say that I want to break all the rules, <laughs> all right? Because there has to be some rules, but I want to break enough where you know what, kids, my my kids, I'm talking about. Yeah. You be who you are. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna love you who you are. Exactly. And I don't give a crap about everybody else thinking about you. Mm-hmm. And that's my perspective. Yeah. Right? Maybe not break them, but like slightly bend them. <laughs> that's what I always say. So tell me, because I know somewhat of your story, but mm-hmm. tell me your story. How did it happen? Like, because I know of people that maybe okay, should I come out? Should I come out? Yeah. And I know I'm gonna get some crap from parents. Like, hey, are you promoting that? I'm like, no. 
these this is their story. Yeah, this absolutely. is who they are, mm-hmm. you know. So let's see. So I so I've always been gay. I've always like no one I've always like it was nothing new to me that I think it wasn't new to me until there was a label put on it. Because I feel oh. like growing up as a Southern Baptist Christian kid, you know, you don't ever it's because we don't talk about it, people don't know about it. So then you just grow up and grow grow up thinking like, Am I the only like boy out here that likes boys? Because I, I felt like that for, like, at least until, like, sixth grade, until people started talking about it, like, in middle school, which is when I came out was middle school, sixth grade. Okay. Yeah, and to me, it was, like, something completely, they're like, are you gay? I was like, what's gay? I'm like, there's like there's a there's a label for that? So it wasn't until then that I really kind of, like, okay, like. Because you weren't exposed to that. Yeah, I, exactly. Because growing up, you're right. In yes. our, we weren't exposed to those yeah. kind of I mean, I grew terms. up singing Christian songs, Sunday school, like, playing out with kids. Like, I was never really involved like in a community besides the church community, like the the wildest thing I probably did growing up was probably like cross cross country in California. Oh yeah, and even then I was like, okay, we're just running for fun. Like I didn't know it was like a sport or anything. It was just like okay, like we're doing it because we're running. Yeah, yeah. So I think I think it's definitely a lot different now because I feel like a lot of the younger generations are more educated. They're more aware of it. Whereas like I feel like for me growing up, I didn't know that was an option. Not to choose it, but to even think like, oh, that's a possibility. Now, how long ago was this? Probably like 10. I'm a, how old <coughs> six, are you? I am 25. So sixth grade was a good, like, almost two decades ago. <laughs> yeah. Time has changed, hasn't it? It, it has. And, I, and I'm very grateful for it, I think, if anything. I think things should change. And change is always not a bad or good thing. It's just depending on how you perceive it and how you initially take it, I feel like. Okay. Yeah. So continue on. So what happened? Um, so sixth grade, I came out. My parents weren't necessarily happy about it i mean my dad was a deacon my mom was head of women's ministry they both held national titles for hbna so they're i don't want to say they're celebrities but they're definitely up there people know about them they i think i think as a child you look up at your parents and i i would consider they have great leadership knowing that what they've gone through and that um they're very patient people and it's it's good to know that we have parents that we can look up to and still at the same time be like okay i might not always agree with the things you do but I know that you're in it for the right intentions and reasons. Was it easy growing up? I wouldn't say yes, and I wouldn't say no. I think there was definitely because, like, I always say because we were so church-orientated, I always told my parents, when you hold a position like we as children, we have to uphold that position for you as well. So very, very tough to, like, bucket guy, you know, and, like, whatnot. So, like, we're always, I feel like me and my sisters were always, like, at funerals. We're always cooking. We're always, like, super involved. You have to be proper. Yeah. You know, you have to put up a front in a way just because yes. you, you know that your parents, not that they're putting up a front, but they hold positions. And in order for them to do that correctly, you also have to up- uplift them as well. So it's basically supporting the support I roles, you, yep. you know. Um, I do. I did enjoy it to, to a degree because, I, I mean, I love being in the kitchen. I love being involved. I love helping out my community. So at so in a way, I was happy doing it, but at the same time, I also knew like it was a front for us as kids. I think my mom and dad didn't have like the easiest time transitioning into it, and I don't. It's not like there's a God book out there teaching you how to love an LBGT kid, you know, especially yeah. for the home culture. And it doesn't help that like I'm the oldest from. So my dad is the youngest from his side, and I'm the oldest of his his kids. Yes, and then my mom is the oldest of her side, and I'm the oldest of her kids. I'm like I'm the first grandbaby from. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So it's like not to say there's a lot of pressure, but there's definitely like some weight on the shoulders at times. But I think as I grew up and up to now, I've just learned to kind of lift it off because those are societal pressures that I feel like should even be put on me. As a child, like, we shouldn't put societal pressure on children. That's not their responsibility to hold. And that's something I've definitely learned along the way. Came out at sixth grade. It was Middle school was definitely hard just because transition with my parents. And then it wasn't until, like, high school where it kind of, like, not that I made it any easier, but it got to the point where there were, kind of transitioning or like telling me like oh you should like do more not boy things but more masculine things were they quietly and just like like was um, it kind of like hush 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 kind of thing i i so the way i explain is i felt like i was swept under the rug oh yes Yes. and i feel like a lot of churches do that to their gay kids they're openly gay kids i feel like um it's not ever specifically talked about but Mm -hmm. it's never specifically brought up as well um which again in a whole nother topic on its own now, let's go back go to when you first came out. in mm. six, Is it sixth grade? Sixth grade, yeah. Sixth grade, yeah. And how did you break the news, man? It I'm was. Like, I'm like, is it something that, did you write a letter? And it's like, okay, here. Oh, no, it this? was like very, no, like, 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 like. how was it? It was like Jack in a Box, like, pop. 
(laughs) (laughs) Just sprung it on your parents, right? Kind of. So we were kind of like having an argument. I remember it was Sunday, of course, after church, and we had gotten into an argument, and it was in the car, like, Grandma and my sisters and my little brother was there, and we all went to the Asian store down the street from church, and we were, I forgot what we were arguing about. And then at one point, I just broke out, and I was like, you guys don't know what it's like. And they're like, like what? I was like, what it's like to be gay. Well, like, was this all built up already? Yeah, or? kind of, in yeah. a way. So, like, the argument was already in session, and it was just kind of building up. And they were like, I think it was a conversation about, like, me hanging out with more boys and stop hanging out with girls. Because, like, in the home culture, like, you know, like that's just not right. Like, boys have to hang out with boys, and boys can't hang out with girls. Like, girl, like girls are, girls do their own thing. Boys do their own thing. And all my friends were girls growing up. Yeah. Yeah, and it was, like, it was just easier for me to gear towards girls. I don't know why. It was just easier to get along with them. Not that I didn't like the guys, because, like, Obviously, I talk and converse with the men as well, but it's just, like, on a personal level, I don't feel much connection. Until guys, like, personally reach out, we can build a connection there. I don't feel like there's a connection I typically have with boys. I think that's what the conversation was about, and then it got to the point where I just kind of broke out, and I was like, you don't know what it's like to be gay. And my mom was like, what? And she wasn't, I mean, <laughs> neither guys, of them were happy you to guys hear the that. Store you know? shopping, yeah, we're, right? like, at the agent store, you know, buying yeah. rice or something, yeah. and then it's like, oh, your son's gay now. Like, what's up? And I'm like, okay. So then my mom was like, don't say that. And that one, I think that whole sixth grade year was just like, it was goddamn awful. Like, I I would not choose to relive it if I had the choice. If I could go back and tell myself to be strong and hold on longer, I probably would. But it just wasn't. Longer as in longer to come up. Not longer to come up, but just like. Or longer, or to share it with him, or what? Just not specifically put up with it, but just wait because it'll get better. I see. Yeah, because I never thought it was ever going to get better after sixth grade. Like, middle school was just horrid for me. Okay. Yeah, not specifically because of the way people treated me, but more so, like, the mental capacity of what I could handle as a sixth grader mm-hmm. at the time. Just because, like, you're just a kid. Like, you're only 11. And the last thing you want to do is, like, lose the fact that, oh, like, my mom and dad aren't going to love me after that, you know, after coming out. And I felt like, to some degree, that's what I believe for the longest time. Okay. Yeah. And we're going to touch upon how mm-hmm. your parents are now. But, yeah. But up to this point. They're like, nope. Okay. Yeah. Um, Are th- in denial, I'm assuming? Or? Denial. They said I was confused, you know, like what, okay. like what specifically did I like about boys. So a lot of it, I would say, yeah, denial. Now, were they, I know, because we talked about religion, right? Because, mm-hmm. you know, we both grew up in church. Yeah, I absolutely. Came, I've been up to Rochester, mm-hmm. you know, I sang at your church yep. when I was younger. Um, did they try to intervene religiously also? I'm assuming, okay, I'm assuming as a parent. Mm-hmm. No, no, yeah. <laughs> that's and who, who goes to church, mm-hmm. and I'm, I'm, I'm just putting myself in some of the parents at church. That's what they would do. Yeah. They're like, let's let's call a pastor to come. Let's yeah. pray for you. Let's do, did they do that or no? Um. So we had some guest pastor just come to the church, and it wasn't like booked ahead or anything. It was just like he was coming to visit casually because it was already planned. And then um, we went to another church member's house afterwards, and that's our, I was like, as a kid, just kind of hanging out with the kids. And then they both sat me down with this pastor. And I don't know who this pastor is. I've never met him before. And then we read the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Mm-hmm. You know, lovely story. Everyone there is, like, homosexual, sleeping around with other men. And then, was it Lot and his son? They, I think an angel told them to come leave the city because God was going to set fire to it. And they both ran away. And then... His wife turned around. No, different story. That's... um. I forgot what that one was, but Lot and his son left the town because of all of the men committing homosexual sin. Mm-hmm. And so then they left and the town was burned. So then I was like, oh my God, like as an 11 year old kid, like I'm like, I'm going to hell because I'm gay. You know, like you, how else are you supposed to perceive that story as an 11 year old kid? Like, okay, I just came out as gay. Obviously my mom and dad aren't extremely accepting, but now we're sitting here reading about people who are burning in the city because they are sleeping with men. So I'm like, I'm going to hell. And yeah. that's what I believe for, like, the longest time. It was, like, my journey with religion has been so hard because of that one experience. And I, I've i definitely healed on and moved on from it. But I still look back and, like, think, like, oh, my God. Like, if I ever had a child that was gay or just coming out, like, I would never have them sit down with someone they don't know. And they're reading about a story that they can't fully comprehend. At that age. At that age, yeah. Wow. And I still... I don't, I don't want to say I give my mom and dad crap for it, but I still bring it up every now and then just because I was like, like, I was literally a kid, <laughs> like 11 years old, like just yeah. in middle school. And it's like figuring out life, figuring out who you are. And at that point, like you, you, I feel like a lot of Hmong kids, Hmong Christian kids don't really have an understanding of who they fully are because they grow up in a community where, oh, well, let's go to church. All we know is church. And I think it's hard for us as an individual, as a community to find who we are 
again, a whole other topic on its own, though. <laughs> you're right. Yeah. And you're right. I, I, I can relate to that. Um, obviously, not in your situation, mm-hmm. but growing up as, as a church. Yeah. Growing up in a church and being sheltered, mm-hmm. you know, and this is all, I was, I tell Auntie this all the time. Like, that's all I knew yeah, as a child. Absolutely. That's all I knew. Guess who my friends were? People at church. Yeah. Okay. Besides my friends at school, that's all I knew. Mm-hmm. Nothing wrong with that, yeah. but I wish I would have had an opportunity to probably meet friends, yeah. kind of get outside my comfort zone, and explore the world. Yeah, bit. absolutely. Because we were, we were sheltered. Mm-hmm. Right? Absolutely, yeah. We were sheltered It's like a magic church. bubble that no one talks about. Yeah, like you're, you're sheltered in the church. Mm-hmm. What's that? No, you can't talk about that. Yep. You can't go there. Yeah. It's kind of like um, in The Lion King, right? Yeah. And, and Mufasa's like, you can't go over there. Yes. You know, mm-hmm. that's the bad land, right? yeah. but you go anyway, right? Yeah. You got to stay over here. Yeah. But to some extent, you got to ex- still explore. Yeah, I think as humans, we're very curious creatures. We, are. we like to know, and it's not a bad thing to know. I think it's a, it's a matter of wanting to know in, how would you say, and like in digressions, I would say. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so we're right. You're right. I understand. Mm-hmm. Like, we're kind of in this bubble. Mm-hmm. Right. So it didn't get any easier. When when did it get easier? When, like, you know, mm-hmm. obviously, we, we can talk about this for hours. Yeah. I want to listen for mm-hmm. hours. But, like, sixth grade... It, the troubles and it, it could progress from there. Did it get any better? High school was a little bit easier, I would say. Um, my mom and dad were obviously wanted me to get involved more and like do more masculine things. So every time they, they always asked me to do something and I always did it, but I was always in control of it. I would say, ah, yes. like my mom tried to get me to do um, guitar with like the boys, and then so I did guitar for like a little bit, <laughs> and and then we we're picking out songs. I was like, oh, I want to sing "Perfect" by Pink. <laughs> so you control your own narrative exactly yeah. i always i always had the upper hand because it's like okay i'm gonna do what you want me to do but like at the end of the day like i'm gonna do what i'm still enjoying as well if i'm gonna do an experience i'm gonna take the best of what i can from it but i'm still gonna i'm still gonna be in charge of it because i'm not gonna do something that you want me to do and have and then not enjoy it you know yeah so and i always thought like okay it's working out it's working out for both ways like i'm still picking up the song i get to play and i'm playing the guitar that you want me to play so it's still working out. They told me to do a sport. I did cheerleading. <laughs> I got on the team. I was captain my senior year. I absolutely love it. I still go back and help coach here and there. Yeah. I, they didn't specify. So you'll Yes, say. exactly. I mean, maybe they wanted to do football, which costs so much more than cheerleading. And then on top of that, like the injuries I would have sustained knowing me because I'm so clumsy. Like I could barely catch a football. Yeah. You're lucky if I can even <laughs> run the speed with you. So yeah. And then. I mean, I was super involved in high school, and I think one is because, like, I never wanted to be home just because uh, I didn't want to be in that energy. So, like, I would go to school, and then I would have, like, um, I also did dance, like, hip-hop growing up, but I was always, like, a very feminine dancer. Like, I was right. always head of the girls. It, if I was in a group, I was always center because I was just, my energy was not better, but I had a charisma with me that when I performed that was just that, that just not outshine, but obviously, like, it's just a personality quality, mm-hmm. I feel like. But I definitely enjoyed that part because I was never home. Like I would go to school at the sunrise and I would come home on the sunset. It'd were be like you, six o'clock. Were you dreading going home though? Or is this just something you want to keep yourself busy? I think one, I like being involved because I felt like I was a part of a community. Yeah. And then two, it was part of me dreaded going home just because I was like, Oh, like here we go again. Like I'm going to go home. And then it's going to be like the same conversations of like, like you can't do this. You can't do that. It wasn't, like, it wasn't every day. Was it? It wasn't every, it wasn't every day, but I, you definitely like just knew like going home, like you're not going to feel like you're fully accepted or fully not welcome, but it's just like, again, like swept under the rug mm-hmm. to say, mm-hmm. like I definitely performed the duties. as like a kid. Like I went home, I cooked for my siblings, you know, I did my homework and whatnot, but yeah, like I just didn't like the energy at home. Okay. Just cause I felt like I wasn't accepted. I would say. So high school was easier. High school was a little bit easier because okay. I felt like I had a community outside of home that I felt welcomed in. Was it any easier at home though? See, that's what I'm trying to get at. It's like, you know, outside of the home, now you've been out for a few years. Yes. Right? So I've been out fully since sixth grade. Like yes. And, yeah. then, and then your parents, they kind of, you know, starting to accept that, okay, this is how our son is. Mm, and not well, yet. Okay. Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah. We'll get there then. But- but you're in high school, outside of high school, mm-hmm. everything's great and fine, fine daddy, yeah. a different world. When you come home, it's like, so how, when did it start getting better at home? Was that still in high school or? In high school, it was still, I guess I would say a little bit easier. I think they just kind of backed off of this because they were like, okay, like, it's not going to change, you know, like, yeah. it's, nothing's going to happen. And as horrible as it sounds, I don't think it got any easier for anyone until my little brother passed away. Oh, yeah. And it's horrible to say that. Like, I, I look back and I'm like, dang, it really... Like, that was such a shock factor in our lives that, like, hit us, like, so hard that it was, like, we all had to transition some way somehow to, like, a new derivative or some, a new direction for us to kind of be, like, okay, like, 
Like this is reality. Yeah. Yeah. And and wh- I think what sucked most about that, I was like, growing up, I had this whole, and it sounds absolutely terrible. And I still look back at look back at it. I'm like, oh my god, like the fact that that was even a thought. Um, like my brother was literally in my head my plan B. My, or plan A at that point, because mm-hmm. I was like, you know what, like, I could still be me, and mom and dad might not might not like me. But this is my little brother. Yeah, thing. but I was like, they could take him because he loves cars, he loves being active, he like he loves hanging out with the guys. Like he was the younger one out of his, like second youngest out of his bunch, but he was always the leader. Like oh, he yeah. was, yeah, he was always like so charismatic, so energetic. Like like he was just so fun, and everyone loved him. And when I like everyone loved him, so I was like, you know what, like it's okay because at, at the end of the day, if they don't have me, they got him. Yeah. And it's sad, like, that narrative is sad. The narrative of having my brother be my plan A is sad. But that's just the way, like, le- like that I processed it. I mean, that's that's only natural, though, to be honest, yeah. okay? And, and I don't want to sidetrack from your no, story, but, um, like, in the Hmong culture, right? Mm-hmm. The youngest, yeah. guess what they do? They take care of the parents. Yes. Right? And your your brother, regardless if, if you're thinking like that or not, is mm-hmm. going to take care of your parents. Exactly. You know? So my younger brother, he's taking care of my dad. Mm-hmm. Obviously, my mom passed away. But, you know, that was like, okay, I don't have to do that. You know, but in your case, I mean, even if you didn't think like that, yeah. your brother would have like stepped yeah. up anyway if, if he was still around. Yeah. So in a way, like he was my backup plan. I was like, you know, yeah. what, it's safe because whether they like me or not, whether they accept me or not, they still have a backup. That'll be fine. Okay. Yeah. And then God was like, nope. <laughs> what happened? Check the backup plan. So my, my little brother passed away 2013 of a brain aneurysm on October. They they always say the 26th. I always say the 25th because that's the day it happened. Oh, okay. yes. There was like so much going on like that day, that week. I remember um, my aunt from California. She actually came and visited, and everyone was telling her like, "Oh, you know, don't come visit. Like you, like there's no point in you visiting. It's not even Christmas yet. It's October." And she was like, "You know, like I never get to see you guys anyway. So I'm just gonna come visit." So she comes up and visits. She's buying all of her Christmas presents early. My brother, he had been kind of already um, like give him a mana. Was he having headaches? He was having headaches. Um, he was already out of school for at least like I want to say a couple weeks or so. Oh, wait, from from the headaches. Yes, from the headaches. Wow, so it was yeah. like. Like, it was just, like, kind of constant at that point. Yeah. Um, my mom and dad had taken him in, like, two weeks in a row prior to the date that he passed because, like, he was having a high fever. He, he said that it was just hurting, and they were saying, like, oh, you know, he's active, he's fine, and they had suggested that we see a neurologist. And then the soonest we can get them was in, um, I believe, December. My mom's like, I need one sooner. So then we got one in November. And then come the, the, the 25th, like, it happened. And I, I still look back at it, and it's like, God will literally build you up to the point where you feel like you're doing fine. Because at one point, I felt like I was doing okay. Because I was like, you know, I was like, cheerleading's going great, high school's going great, I'm loving it. I was like, people accept me for who I'm in high school, and if it doesn't work out at home, it's okay, like, they have my little brother. And then that last day, I remember it so vividly, because it was the night before. So our that Friday was our last football game ever of the season, <clears throat> and of my junior year, and I had my uniform laid out. Because we had a pet fest, so we were going to perform that morning. So I had my uni- my true uniform laid out, and then I went to sleep. And then five forty five, like exactly five forty five, my sis, I wake up. My sisters are like screaming. I'm like, what the heck? It's like my alarm didn't go off yet. What's happening? So I go over to the next room, and then <clears throat> Cassidy's like on the phone. I think she, at that point she was talking to Chul, and then Kaylee's already like kind of crying. And then how old, how old was your brother at that? time? He was only eight. So no, Jimmy, I sound like so very oh young. Oh my goodness, yeah, yeah, like yeah. Like, so young, and I still can't, like, fathom the fact that, like, he was only, and I, I don't question it. God takes who he takes, and, again, I don't question the higher power because that's that's not up to me, you know? Definitely made peace about it. I think I still cry about it, obviously, because it's, like, it's like my little brother, you know? Yeah. But I walked in the room, and my grandma was, like, holding him limp on the bed. So the structure of the room was you walk in, my sister, Cassidy and Kayla have a bed. Right next to them is grandma and my little brother. So then grandma's, like, holding his body, and and, like, you can tell, like, I didn't know at that point if he was, like, gone, if he was just kind of, like, out of it. So then Cassidy comes back in the room, and she's, like, screaming at and I'm like, my brother isn't breathing. So I told her, I was like, I need you to shut up, and I will take the car. I was like, go calm down. And I'm still surprised that I was so calm, you know? So then I go over, and I'm, like, on the on the phone. I was like, hi, like, my brother isn't breathing. And at that point, I already, for some reason, like, I had already checked if he was breathing and if he had a pulse. He didn't have either. So then I'm talking to, the, and it didn't like fully hit me yet because I think I was still in the shock. Mm-hmm. But the operator is okay. I need you to put him on the floor flat and just um, start doing compressions. So I was like, okay. And then I put him down, and as soon as I put him down on the flat, like his head just like kind of went to the side, and I was kind of like, ooh, like okay, like what's happening? So then she's like, I put her on speaker. She's like, start doing compressions and count them out loud. So I started counting, and I, I remember getting lost at 200. And I started to like, because his head kept going limp. 
and my um I lost kind of two hundred and I started to tear up. And then it's and it's so different for anyone who's ever had anyone passed away or just had an emergency at their house, when you hear the ambulance and then you know that it's coming to you, it's like a whole nother experience. Because it's like, oh my God, like they're coming to us. And mm-hmm. it feels like forever because you can hear it, but it doesn't register like they're coming to us. How long is it going to take? When is it going to happen? My mom had already gone to work that morning and usually she checks on us every morning. Like she'll give us a kiss or she'll just come and look at us. But for that, for some reason that morning, she didn't. And so when she was already on her way to work and then Chul had called her hey, you need to go home right now. Like, your son isn't breathing. And so my mom kind of, like, froze in traffic. She didn't know. Like, again, shock factor. Like, what the heck? And she works at Mayo, so she's probably, like, downtown somewhere in her van. She's, like, she. I remember her saying, she's, like, I just stopped in traffic. Like, I didn't know what to do. Then she called my dad, and my dad calmed her down, told her, like, you need to get home. I was, like, I need you to breathe, and I need you to go home. And she comes home, and at that point, the paramedics were there, and I remember my mom just coming up the stairs. And she looked like, I don't know how my mom and dad do it. I don't know how they're always so composed and so, like, together. It blows my mind. But the fact that she just kind of walked in and she was like, okay, like, what's happening? They told me to get out. Um, I was being questioned from an officer. And he was just asking, like, what's going on? What happened? Like, what are the events? Did anything happen the night before? I was like, we all went to sleep as normal. I woke up at 545. My sisters were screaming, you know, given the events and time and whatnot. And then at that point, I think Chu and Chia were at our house. Isaiah had already went to school, so he didn't even know what was happening. Um, Cassidy, KV, Bell were all in, we were all there besides Isaiah. So then that happened, and then my mom went on the ambulance drive with with my brother to the. Okay. And so at that point, we we're kind of like, okay, like what's what's gonna happen? I was like, do I still go to school? And I think initially I wanted to go to school just to get it off my head, and I already knew like the the team depended on me because I was one of the main bases for the routine which we have worked so hard on. And so I called my coach and I was like, hey, like, I'm not able to come in. Like, my brother's in the ICU. Mm. So then they're like, okay, like, you know, don't worry about it. Like, just be with your family. And I was like, okay. Mm. And um, so then we all ended up going to the hospital. It was my sisters, my grandma, and my mom. And then, my, my, keep in mind, my dad's on the cities. Which is how far from you guys? An hour, probably an hour, an hour, 15 minutes. <clears throat> yeah. Um. So he, because my mom was, knew what happened, she called him. He always already were, and I'm guessing he just came straight down. So then we're all in. Um, we go see my little brother, and, you know, like, he's, like, wrapped up in all these white cloths to keep him warm. There's, like, wires going everywhere. So it's, like, it's, like, a whole hospital scene, like, from a movie. You're, like, oh, crap, like, this is really happening. Yeah. So then we um, we go to a separate room, and then my dad arrives, and then the chaplain arrives. And you know when the chaplain shows up, it's, like, okay, like, Uh-oh. this is do or die, you know? Yeah. So then, funny enough, my dad knew the chaplain because his – that church seriously was yeah it's so so wow. weird so many weird things are like happened that like the police officer that i that was questioning i knew him from three other experiences weird um but that chaplain was also i believe they sponsored my dad's family to come to wow Rochester. yeah so then my dad has like pictures of when they first originally came and when he had like a whole bunch of hair and they were like at the <laughs> church you know like he has pictures with you having hair you sure no, I'm yeah he had a lot of hair i'm like oh my god but he just I'm i mean just he kidding. looks good bottled the gold tea you know yeah yeah um yeah, so then at that point, we all kind of were, I couldn't process it because I'm still, like, in shock, but I obviously knew that person was there for a reason. And I yeah. was just like, ah. So then we talked to the chaplain, and we prayed about it. We talked about it. We're all crying at this point because it's like, okay, it's really hidden us. They take him up to ICU. They're doing, like, CT scans. We talked about it with some couple doctors, and they got to the point where it's just, like, um, his brain was flooded with all the blood from the brain aneurysm, which was, like, at the, at the stem of his neck. Uh-huh. And so he, like, at that point, like, they shot cold water in his ear, and his Theoretically, if your eyes, like, how would you say it? Contract. Uh-huh. Your people contract. Like, obviously, like, there's some brain activity. But, like, it but wasn't. Have. Yeah. So, like, so then we kept on the ICU for, I want to say, like, I believe two days. And then on Sunday was when we decided, Saturday initially, they decided to do organ donation. And then um, Sunday was when it happened. So, okay. yeah. But it was, again, a lot for just one weekend. Like, we had people from Milwaukee. We had people from the cities. Like, it wow. was a whole gathering in the you hospital. Know, We've, we've heard about it. Obviously, mm-hmm. we were here. Yeah. Auntie and I were here in Milwaukee. We heard about it, and we were, like, blown. I'm like, what the it, heck is going on? This is the first time I'm hearing details. Yeah. You're giving me goosebumps, man. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a lot. It is. It is. And I think another big aspect of it was, like, even the things that we don't talk about, like, organ donation. It was, that to me was, I couldn't fathom the fact that people were so against it. And your mom and dad, yeah, they're okay with it. Yeah, so my mom and dad asked 
I think they had the conversation with God, and God gave them the answer to that, you know, because my little brother wanted to be, um, I believe, either a police officer or, 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 or a firefighter, is what he had said. So then they, I think they talked about it, they prayed about it, and whatever process it was, they had initially said it on organ donation. My mom had respectfully asked her family, who are Catholic, and she was like, you know what, it's like, we've already made the decision. The last thing I need is for someone to fight me on it, and we're going to decide organ donation. And my, fa- and my mom said, I was like, okay, deal done. You know, but like my dad said, because um, some of them, yes. it was hard. Har- it was a harder conversation because. On your dad's side? Yes. Okay. Because like you don't touch the body, you know, when it's done. You, Correct. You, you respect it. Correct. You put it away. Done. You know, so they were like, why would you do that? Like. You got a lot of beef for it. Then. Yes. So it was a harder conversation. And, and my big thing was like, it shouldn't even have to be hard because someone just lost a child. Like, I look back and I'm like, why are we even fighting about this when a child is, at that point, deceased? I was like, the parents are already going through it. The last thing they need is for pushback on the decisions they're making for their family and their child. So let it be. And I think that's something that, obviously, Hmong people as a culture still need to touch base on. If it's like, if it's not your child, if it's not your business, you should support it. Mm-hmm. No I would questions. agree. Definitely. No questions. The fact that you would question someone's authority and someone's question to do with their child's body out of your control. Let it be. Don't They're care. the parents. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And yes. And I still look back. I'm like, how, like, a mother losing their child, a father losing their child, like, the mental capacity to even withhold that is just yeah. a lot. And I still give my parents a lot of credit for it because they've come a very far away from just that and Correct. in general. So. And when we found out, I was in shock. I'm yeah. like, wow. I've, that was the first. Yeah. The first that I've ever heard of any mom parent doing that. Yes. Good for them. That's forward exactly. thinking. That's something that's more contemporary. Yes. You know, it's like my little brother left. I can't do anything about it. I can be mad about it at the moment. But at the end of the day, like, I don't get to question God and I need to let that go. Mm-hmm. So, and I've learned to let it go. I still, I mean, I still have like my, like, what if moments, you know, of, like, what if he was still alive, you know, like, would he have a girlfriend? Like, a, would I be doing her makeup? Would he be like a football quarterback? You know, like little things like that that make me kind of tear up a little bit sometimes. But that's life. You ponder, you wonder. So, plan A, obviously, your brother. Like, so scratched out. <laughs> scratched out. <laughs> yeah. So, what happened? So, okay, so let's continue on because I want to get to the point of where you're at now, right? Yes. So, uh, so plan A is gone. Yes. Uh, so, you're going through high school. Yes. And life, again, it didn't, we're, I mean, we're all dealing with it. And it was like little things that I like back now. And I see that like my mom was like slowly kind of making her way through it. And I don't think she knew it. I don't think anyone kind of knew what was happening. We're, we're obviously just transitioning into away from the grief at this point and i've never my mom and my mom and dad never fully supported me in anything that i maybe they did and i just didn't know it you know from my perspective um but like they never came to any of my concerts to watch me dance they never came to any football games to watch me cheer you know so then we had like a cheer camp and i asked my mom if she could make egg rolls and she did so and that's something i look back at and i um i wish I didn't call her out for it because I'm like, I think like a couple of weeks later, I mean, I was happy she made the egg goes for everyone. Everyone loved it. The cheerleaders loved her. But then like, I think a couple of weeks later, she was having a fight with Cassidy about something. And I, in turn, I was defending my sister and I was like, like, you never support us. You and I was like, you and dad are always so involved with church. I was like, you never like support us. And I looked back and I was like, oh my God, like how dumb of me. I was like two weeks ago, she just made egg rolls for the team. I was like, how <clears throat> dumb of me. And I was so upset at myself because I was like, she literally just took time away out of her day to make a batch of eggos for your team. And here you are just kind of blowing her off. And I think it was just a lot of, again, like grief and everything kind of mixed in together at that moment. And I never got to around to apologizing about it, but I still think about it. I'm like, damn, like what a, excuse my language. I was like, what a dumbass. Like, <laughs> like the yeah. first time in who would have known ever that your mom takes time to, decently support your team and then you just blow her off like two weeks later you never apologized for that i know yeah well you just did i mean publicly on air (laughs) i hope so mom if you hear that i am so sorry and i still think about that to this day because i'm like oh my god like why would what like why did you do that like that was a moment in my past where i was like dang we should have just like that shouldn't even came out my mouth yeah yeah so again baby steps because it's never easy yeah but that was definitely a baby step that i for granted and I didn't even look back to recollect so yeah. it didn't to answer your question it didn't fully start to get easier until proper when I was 20 probably when I turned 23 because in 2018 high school was great graduated no we moved on 2015 my parents moved up to the cities so now I ended up staying of Chua in Rochester so I, I told my mom that I was going to be going to to school 
Didn't work out for me. It wasn't my plan. Um, I ended up working for SAC, which is Squeeze Child Care in Rochester. And I was involved with the school district. And I also started working at um, Sephora inside Jersey Penny. Okay. Very part time. So like more like weekends and nights. Um, I did that for a good two years living with Chul and then um, moved up to the cities in hopes of, oh my God, we're going to be one happy family again. Like we're going to make it work. So then I moved up to Woodbury, particularly to be with my parents. Even like, you always hope that it's going to be better. It's going to get better. And sometimes distance is just what makes it better. But I moved back, and my mom and dad are still heavily involved in church as well. Um, so there was, like, set rules that, like, not, like, I'm not allowed to wear makeup. I can't. Um, I, have to, I have to dress in a certain way if I'm going to church, you know, which I'm like, okay. And we had the conversation of which my parents are like, you know, if you're living with us, like, you have to dress a certain way when you go to church. I'm like, okay. I was like, and I came to an agreement that I thought of. I was like, if it makes you happy, I would be more than happy to go out and buy male quotation male clothing or masculine clothing that makes you happy. I was like, it doesn't make me happy, but if we're going to compromise and I can do that, then let's do that. Now let's stop there for a second. Cause you, were you not wearing guy clothing or I bounced back between both. Okay. I All mean, right. my, my personal aesthetic and style is a little bit more feminine. Okay. Um, but if, I mean, like guy sweats are hella comfortable. Why would I not wear them? <laughs> guy, basketball shorts? Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, it's like I pick and choose on my days, which, I mean, aesthetically, give or take. Whatever how you feel. Like yeah, exactly. Okay. And I look, I, I feel like I look very androgynous. So I think that's what, that was like the biggest thing. People couldn't tell if I was a boy or girl. Okay. And yes, yeah, so, so there was this, I asked them that. And they more confusing because they were both like, if it doesn't make you happy, don't do it. And I was like. What? what? Yeah. <laughs> I was like, that I'm trying to meet y'all in the middle here. There has to be some kind of compromise. And then I was like, I think maybe that was maybe the answer I was, that just needed to come out at that point. So then I had a comment. I dropped my dad off at the airport and I told my, and I told my dad, I was like, you know, if that's what it comes to, then I'm more than happy to do it for you guys. I might not be happy doing it, but if it makes you happy, yeah. so be it. Yeah. And my dad, if you're not, if it doesn't make you happy, don't do it. I was like, okay. I was like, like WTF what do we do now you know so then I talked to my mom about it and she was like if it doesn't make you happy don't do it and I was like so so what do we want here then because and I straight up told her I was like no one is going to be happy I was like that's that's just the reality of it I was like if like I'm not going to be happy with me you're not going to be happy with me that's just the way it's going to be that was a conversation that was had and then I mean I still wore whatever the heck I wanted Mm -hmm. I didn't care for it because it's also like like what like, I'm not going to walk around. I feel like I have to be judged by absolutely everybody for no reason. And that's just not a way to live. Um, so that was had. And then from 2018 to 19, I went back to move in of Chul. And I went to beauty school in Rochester. So I tra- transitioned back to Rochester. And I picked Rochester so late. I went, I toured Empire Beauty School up in Bloomington. And it just, like, I just didn't want to make the drive constantly with traffic and everything. Rochester was smaller. It was more... It was like it's a slowly growing city, so there was semi opportunities to be held, and it was just easier to be in a town where I knew I could garner my skill and my growth and have a good, decent clientele backing me up because everyone didn't know of anything at that time, and it was like I was probably like one of. I mean, I was gay. Everyone knew my presence in town a little bit, you know, because it's such a small town, so it it worked out in my favor. So I went back, moved into school, went to beauty school, graduated, got my license. Um, and then I started working at Sephora inside JC again. Um, I was one of the managers there for the short time being that I was there. And then essentially I ended up quitting there and going back to the school district because it wasn't working out. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I moved out about a year or so afterwards on my own. So that was great. Had my own apartment for about a year and a half and then I moved in with my friend after that. Okay. But it didn't initially it wasn't until I went to school and I started like there are things you think you would never be able to do because just because of how you were brought up. So then going to beauty school was a whole other thing. I was like, oh my God, like I am really capable of doing something that I love. I am really capable of being smart, you know, because I felt like growing up in high school, it was, I was like, like you gotta, you know, like Asian parents are always like, you gotta get A's. <laughs> A's, like that's the goal. You, you gotta become yes. a doctor. You gotta become something with like a major six, 10 year degree. And I'm like, you gotta make the money. Yeah, I was like, nursing ain't for me. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I'm not gonna be a doctor, you know? If I even catch a football, what do you, what do you think I'm gonna do with a scalpel, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so then, and the funny thing was like, I had, I didn't have the best grades because I think after my little brother died, I didn't care. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and it's funny because, like, they would go to my conferences expecting the teach. I felt like they were expecting the teachers to see something horrible. And they were all like, he's a great student. He's, a, like, a great human being. He comes in. He participates. And I'm like, 
Like, did you think they were like, oh, he skips school and he doesn't do anything. He shows up. He doesn't give a crap. I'm like, no, I got along with all my teachers very well. I got along with the faculty very well. So um, that was good. But then it wasn't until 23. I mean, yeah, that I turned 23 that I was aware that I was capable of doing something that I love and doing it well. You know, so like doing makeup, I didn't know that I had the extent to create a career for myself because I was never led to think that, mm-hmm. you know, being an artist, I feel like in the home community is something that is so shunned upon because it's like, that's not a way to make money. But it's like, sometimes it's not about making money. What if I just want to do something I love? And if I have what to makes struggle, you happy. To, yeah. And if I have to struggle to do it, like at the end of the day, like that's the experience. I might struggle to do it, but if I'm happy and it gives me rewards at the end of the day, like I'm more than happy to do that. So, so that's where you are now. Yes. How about okay? So how about your parents? Where are they? Um, baby steps again, but I okay. think we've reached a point where it's getting better. I want to say, I my birthday was January thirteenth, and my mom had posted on my Facebook page like just something so mind blowing to me because she's never said it out loud or publicly before. She's like, "Happy birthday, son! Um, I hope you enjoy your birthday." And just know that I am always rooting for you and I'll always support you and I hope you follow your dreams to become the person that you want to be. And it threw me for like an emotional loop. <laughs> like I was doing my makeup for work that morning and I read that and I was like, oh my, I'm like panicking, like hyperventilating. I was like, she's never done this before. <laughs> like, like my birthday is it's like one of those sacred days for me where like I, I always block it out for people. Like I always, um, so on Facebook, I'll change the date so no one says happy birthday to me. Cause it's like, it's weird. It's my one day where I'm like, okay, I can be normal. You know, no, you know what? That's me. I do that too. Yes. I don't want people to know when my birthday is. Yes. Yeah. And and my roommate thought it was weird because she's like, for someone who likes attention so much, like, mm-hmm. I don't get it. And it's not that I don't like attention because I feel like I do, but sometimes, like, with people, I'm going to just say it the way it is. When people have a certain personality, people are just going to give you attention no matter what. Mm-hmm. Like, you're just one of those people that people gear towards and they just feel comfortable around you. And sometimes I just want to be like, can we not talk today? Can I, like, can I just be, I don't got time to give advice today. I don't got time to help people today. Can I just be me for a second? and not have to worry about anyone but myself. And so that was where I was kind of at with my birthday. And when my mom sent that to me, it was like, it threw me out because I was like, what? You care about me being my actual person? And I was like doing my concealer in my eyes, and I was like, fine. So I'm like trying to call my sister. I was like, like FaceTime, like, pick up. You know, it's 8, eight o'clock in the morning. She's probably sleeping or whatever. And she didn't pick up. And then I saw like tearing up midway through my makeup. And I was like, like, brave, get it done with. So then, yeah. I was very emotional that morning, but then my dad came down and had lunch with me, and that went really good. Oh, he came down yes. from, from cities. Yes, down. he always comes down for lunch with me, but I think cool. we, had, yeah. we had some minor stuff that we had um, talked about that, like, that words were exchanged, and it wasn't, like, the happiest of words. So then when he came down, he, like, went to a, a buffet. He, like, took pictures with me and sent it to the family chat, which never happened. Wait, wait, when was this? Like, this, recently? This. For my birthday, yeah. Like, on my actual birthday, January 13th. So, like, he came down, and he took pictures of me and put on the family chat. I was like, what? You're taking pictures of me? And, like, I had, like, blue eyeshadow on. And I'm like, <laughs> like this is not normal. <laughs> what is wrong with you guys today? Yeah. So then, so, yeah. So I think we're headed in a good direction. Again, good. baby steps. Not mad about it. I'm I, And I've never wanted to rush the process of them transitioning into accepting me. Just, just because, again, there's no God book on it. There's no... I didn't want to put a time limit as something that could take years for someone, you know? I think me coming out, it took me until 23 to fully learn and the extent of my knowledge, my skills, and just loving myself. So I was like, if it took me that long, like, it might take someone else longer to even learn to love something they're not used to, something they're not even comfortable with. So Correct. Cause, okay, so let me give you, let me give you, obviously you know already, mm-hmm. but I just want to share with the audience, at least my opinion of a parent's perspective, yeah. right? Which is, it's hard. No, right. there's, yeah. there's no freaking book yes, that absolutely. I can read or I can say, you know, especially if we're reading from the Bible, mm. right? Because the Bible is totally against it. Yeah. So to have grown up as a parent, you know, to be, to have a child like that, you know, it's difficult. Yeah. You know, for sure. and you're the first. Yes. You're the oldest. Yeah. Like, like that makes it any easier, yeah. you know? <laughs> so, so, so I think, I think as a parent, you know, I'm assuming, I, I can't speak for a parent, mm. but as a parent, it's something that we have to get used to. Yes, And it's sure. something that's a process that in our head, um, it's not just, okay, this is what I should do, mm-hmm. right? And I know I need to do it, yeah. but to get there is going to be difficult, yes. you know? And, but it doesn't mean, and I can put myself in your parent situation, it doesn't mean that I love you any less. Yes, you know? You know? Yeah, and absolutely. it doesn't mean that, um, you know, I'm not going to be involved, mm-hmm. right? I'm going to support you as much as I can, yes. but be patient with me. Yes. 
Yeah, and I, and you said it perfectly, which is you can allow them to take their time yeah. to get what they need to get. Mm-hmm. Because if you do rush them, just like how if they rush you, yeah, all hell is gonna break loose. Yes. communication yeah. is gonna break down. Mm-hmm. You know, so and I definitely think like I, I think the things that I like, I'm just a very flamboyant, very feminine, loud, outspoken person in general. You know. I never wanted to rush them, but did I ever feel like I made it any easier for them, me being me? Absolutely not. Like, it was just like, like, I'm just very charismatic. I'm very loud. I'm very out there. And I'm not, like, the quiet person in the room. Like, sometimes I'm the life of party. Sometimes I'm not. But, like, again, when people gear towards you, just because you're different, people, like, want to get to know you. Mm -hmm. People want to, like, I think sometimes it's trish people that, like, gear towards me the most. And sometimes it baffles me because it's, like, like, I'm just different. Like, I'm everything you're taught against. But for some reason, you want to, like, talk with me or converse with me. And I'm like, is this right? <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, like, even at church, again, like, people people notice. You know, you don't turn a blind eye to someone who walks in who's very flamboyant and feminine and everyone wants to get to know them. But at the same time, it's also like it wasn't, again, it wasn't easy for my parents to see that and be like, okay, this, my gay son is at the focal point of attention. And sometimes you don't want that to be the focal point okay. of attention. So. Let me ask: um, Are you are you still going to church though, or kind of? I that in the I still of, believe in God. Um, I hard for me to go to church because I don't want to go to a church where I feel like um, you're constantly not welcomed, but your presence isn't called for. I would say. Okay. Like I want to go to a church and I want to feel like a part of the community. I want to I want to be able to watch kids. I want to be able to help out wherever I can. You know, but I think a lot sometimes. So I always say I'm not afraid of the Bible. I'm afraid of the people who teach it. Oh, yeah. Because a lot, sometimes the, I think I've been hurt most by the people in the church rather than my parents, I feel like. You know, I, I and call it excuses or whatnot, but I've never put hate towards my parents because I know that they're my parents. I was like, you know what, it's not going to be easy for them. I don't expect it to be easy for anyone. And if anything, it's not like their parents grew up with it. It's not like. It's not like it was ever talked about. Correct. So I can't, I, that's always their leeway. And I excuse the way they've treated me because of it. Because that's also like, again, they didn't know any better. Like, what was I expecting? Magic and, ra- magic and rainbows? Like, it, it, it doesn't work out that way in reality, you know? Mm-hmm. It's like they had to learn. And if anything, we're all still learning. So everything's going baby steps. Yeah. I mean, from what I'm hearing, baby steps. Baby steps. Everything's going towards maybe a positive direction. Yes. You know, mm-hmm. and communication's open. Mm-hmm. Recently, birthday... Yeah, it awesome. Was like confusing, but it worked out. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not mad about it. I was very happy. I was just very shook, but very happy. Okay, so, yeah, cool. You know what? You know, I have to say, it's been amazing just hearing that story mm-hmm. because I know of people, yeah. but I've never had, I never had them explain to me. Mm-hmm. And I'm assuming people that are listening, there are par- there might be some parents listening. Yeah. But you know what? The lesson for me is like, listen. Yeah, absolutely. Listen to your kids. Mm-hmm. You know. They're not going to, I don't know, like, like, for example, I listen to my kids, right? Yeah. And, but sometimes I don't. Mm-hmm. And I have to check myself and say, okay, even though they're still kids, I have to listen to them. Yes. You know, because it's a two-way street. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I think I, not to say like the mistake that I think as parents make as just a home culture, I feel like we think because like, oh, but you mean like, yo, or like they're not of age, like they don't know any better. Yes. It's yes. so false. Like working of children, they are so beyond their years. They... The kids are not stupid. They are constantly listening. They're constantly watching. And whatever they see you do, you better bet they're going to mimic it because you're the person they look up to the most. Correct. And I think, especially growing up in a church setting, especially if you're church leaders, you need to be aware the most that you're always at the focal point of attention because the younger generations are always going to be looking up to you. Whatever you do, whatever you project, whatever you share, they're going to take that in and they're just going to amplify that. And that's my biggest frustration with the church. Again, a whole other topic. But <laughs> yeah. listen to your kids, no matter their age, like, and speak to them in a manner that is respectful as well. Just because they're kids, like, speak to them as though you were speaking to an adult sometimes because that even that goes a long way. You know, you brought up something interesting because we had a family gathering here at my mm-hmm. house um, on Friday night. Mm-hmm. Um, it wasn't an intervention, but it was a conversation I wanted to have with yeah. the rest of the family. And that is exactly what you said is that we talked about communicating even as a child yeah. because as parents, we were always telling the kids what to do, yeah. right? But we never listen to yeah. what is in their head. Mm-hmm. Yes, you're right. Their kids are three-year-old, no, not three, a five-year-old, yeah. six-year-old, you know, doesn't make sense. But you know what? Let me just listen to you. Yeah, and let me absolutely. take some interest in, in what you're doing because I believe that we have to teach our kids to express themselves. Absolutely. 
You know why? Because as a dad, right? As my as my daughter Taylor, dad, blah 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 blah. Okay, yeah. whatever, whatever. I got things to do. Yeah, dad, blah blah blah. Okay, I'm not teaching her how to communicate. Yeah. I'm just keep teaching her that you know what? I'm, whatever I'm going to tell you is yeah. insignificant. Mm-hmm. I'm just going to walk away. And yeah. whatever I have in my head as a child, you know, at that age doesn't matter. And then as they grow older, and as I continue to, to do that. treat them, treat them that way, eventually my communication, like I'm going to tell them, like, okay, all right, Taylor, I need you to do this, whatever, Dad, and you're going to yeah. walk away. Again, it's, it's learned behavior. It's learned behavior. Mm-hmm. That's I might mean okay. It hasn't happened yet, but you know, I just don't want that because mm-hmm. as a dad, okay, everybody's different. Every yeah, parents are absolutely. different. I always want to think, okay, what is it that I need to do, okay, as a dad, right? Or, you know, moms who are moms that can show the kids, okay, you know, this is how you need to be as an adult. Because if we need to treat them as adults, okay, or or if we should be treat them as adult, you know, let's do that, you know. Let's have a conversation. Exactly. And then they need to learn. Yeah. Because, like you said, there's no book written on it for parents to do this stuff, you know. And it's like, like, I feel like as Asian American and even, like, Cause it was your, are you, were you born here? Or were you born? I was a year old when we came to you to the States. Yeah. So basically I grew up in the States. Yeah. But even then like your, your mom's parenting styles, whether it's passed on or not, it's like, it's completely different than maybe what even your parenting styles are. But at the same time, it's also like it's passed down, passed on behaviors, passed down patterns that maybe we are, we don't even realize that they yeah. are, you know, or to that, that's always how we've done yeah, it. Yeah, you know? exactly. So it's, um, it's a matter of, breaking down those barriers and those behaviors and switching them out for new ones that are, are going to garner growth and opportunities to learn from each other. Yeah. yeah. I think at a, at a young age, right. Mm-hmm. And I think as parents, and I'm just speaking from the parents perspective, yeah. you know, is that if we listen to our kids at a young age, we can help, help them navigate some of these emotional trials. Yes, absolutely. Or help them navigate through whatever issues that they have, mm-hmm. you know? Um, I, tr- and again, I try to do that as a dad all the, yeah. every day. Taylor comes and talk to me. I'm like, okay, what is it that you want to do? Dad, come here. Okay, yeah. I'm gonna, let me go see what you're doing mm-hmm. instead of me. Okay, forget it. That's a little kid stuff. I don't yeah. want to deal with it. But would you agree? Like, Absolutely. I think, listen to your kids. Yes. Like, acknowledge valid- it. Yep. Everyone is entitled to validating their own feelings, but keep in mind that like everyone literally has feelings. So validate them. If a child needs to cry, let them cry. But then have a conversation after that. Like, Why are we crying? Correct. What was happening? Are you okay? Here's the hard part. It's for dads nowadays. We're not touchy feely. Yes, and again, like <laughs> societal masculine views, whatever you want to call it. Yes. you know. Uh, I, I I tell I was telling oh, who was I talking to? I would like to I was telling someone that I would like to be the exception, right? Because mm. I like to listen. And I yeah. want to make sure that my kids are heard, and that we have we do. Auntie and I we have meetings with our kids, and we talk about okay, how do we become, um, how do we progress in becoming better adults? Mm-hmm. You know, and so. I don't know. I'm hoping whoever's listening, mom and dads, whoever that's listening, that yeah. just for them to be open to the process. Yeah, so. absolutely. It's like, again, little moments that we can learn from. So Cool. All right. Thank you for coming in. Absolutely. Hey, would you be okay if I list your contact information? Absolutely, yeah. In case, in case there are people, mm-hmm. a person who might be in the same situation. Yeah. Have you advised other people? Um, I, I have. Um, it's... Is it like professional information? Absolutely no, not. No, but you it's know, your own personal yeah, experience. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So. Just like a dad, right? There's no book written. Yeah, There's exactly. no school for me to be a dad. Exactly. But if a dad said, hey, you know, my child is like this, mm-hmm. what should I do? You know what? Let's have a conversation. Yeah, absolutely. I don't have the answer, mm-hmm. but let me help you think through it. And mm-hmm. let me share you with you my experience because yeah. everybody's different. Would you be okay for me absolutely. sharing that? Absolutely, Okay, yeah. cool. Let me do that then. So, all right. Thank you, absolutely. Chancellor. No, now, thank you. Chancellor is your name, but on Facebook, you're you Freedom have, Yang. Freedom Yang. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so thank you for coming in. All right. Thank and you. I think if you're willing to, I would like to continue to have these conversations with absolutely, you. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, if you're back here in Milwaukee, mm. absolutely. Because <laughs> I got all this stuff I, I need to I will let you know if I'm back and I'm like, hey, <laughs> bad, let's do a podcast. <laughs> yes, definitely. Okay. So, all right, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for sticking around with us. If you like what you're listening to, please click that like button, okay, subscribe, share with your friends. All right, thank you.